On December 7th at the 2023 Video Game Awards, Atlas debuted the second trailer for Metaphor Refantasio, titled The Royal Tournament. A few days later, Atlas held a live stream that was hosted by the main voice actors for the game. The live stream also included a new video from the developers of the game titled Creator's Voice that included detailed information about the game world, the game's overall story, new gameplay mechanics, and so much more. And if that wasn't enough, just 10 days later, Metaphor was the cover story in Weekly Famitsu, the most read gaming magazine in Japan. It included 18 pages worth of interviews and art from the game. Rather than to try to cover everything here, I've decided to just focus this video on the unique details I noticed that most people might not be aware of. For a complete breakdown of everything else, check out the articles on PersonaCentral.com and RPGSite.net. Links are in the description. So let's get started. The trailer begins with a shot of the protagonist, the traveling boy, in a cart. This is when he's a member of the volunteer army. As you can see, he's wearing the uniform. You can also make out Strahl in the background. Judging by how far they're sitting apart, this may be when the traveling boy meets Strahl for the first time. It then cuts to some desert combat. Gallica makes a remark that suggests that she's only just recently met him when she says, wow, you actually have some impressive moves. Then again, maybe this is just the first time she's ever seen him fight. We can see he's in the Tradia Desert on his way to the capital, most likely to attend the king's funeral, like many citizens, as seen in this shot of the caravan. Later, when we see the protagonist and Strahl have reached their destination, the northern border fort, they are members of the royal army, and Gallica is with them. So while this is probably after the desert portion at the beginning of the game, you can tell this is still early on, as neither Strahl or the traveling boy has awakened to the power of archetypes yet. In that cart, we see the protagonist holding the novel mentioned in the previous trailer, a fantasy story about our modern world. The cover has a sort of Art Deco style depiction of a modern city skyline, and if you look closely, you can even make out a jet flying through the sky. But perhaps most interesting is that we can actually make out the title of the novel on its spine. The runes translate to Utopia. At the end of the first trailer, there was actually a brief flash from the book, and there's a passage that describes what a utopia is. Another interesting thing I noticed was on the recently redesigned website. As you scroll down the page, you can see a very subtle background video showing various images from a modern city. I was able to extract this video, and when viewed clearly, you can see that it is a 3D rendering of a sort of microcosm of Tokyo, with various landmarks such as Shibuya and Tokyo Tower present. Along one edge is a large banner, and this matches the spine of the novel and also reads Utopia. This appears to be a sort of artistic representation of our world, as imagined by the readers of the novel. In the trailer and live stream, a new, as of yet named party member can be seen. He's a grizzled warrior with an eye patch who wields the mage and magician archetypes. He's a member of the Roag tribe, known for their long lifespans and thus elderly appearance, as well as the traditional markings on their faces. We see this character escorting the traveling boy and Strahl through some Nord mines. Footage from the website reveals even more of this area of the game. In my last video, I mentioned another party member whose name we could only see ends in the letters A-H. It's now been revealed that this is Juna, the blonde-haired girl who wears a 60s-style dress. She's a member of the Nydia tribe, who have iridescent eyes and hair. According to the live stream, they are very social and talented at flattery, but this has led them to have a reputation as being untrustworthy. I've tried to translate the bonding scene with Juna, and it goes something like this. It begins with her saying, I have to go there. Well then, this way. We see that time will advance when we do this. And then she says, I've been told this before. Your song is the magic that can change the world. At that time, I didn't really understand. The power of imagination can alter the world. Truly, that's the true nature of magic, don't you think? 
The traveling boy has three options. He could say, I feel like I understand, I don't think so, and it's difficult. He chooses the first and then says, indeed, I feel like I understand. She smiles and says, <laughs> I'm glad to hear you say that. I think we're going to get along. In a later part of the conversation, she says, So it does. One wrong move and we'd both be dead. But it's thanks to you I was able to awaken my archetype. Just before this scene, we can see Yufa sitting nearby. She's the three-eyed party member we saw in the first trailer. She's a member of the Mustari tribe. They come from an archipelago and have their own unique faith and as such are considered pagans. Part of their culture includes wearing masks, and as you can see here, Yufa is holding one of her own. Another of the eight major tribes revealed are the Ishkia tribe, who all have light-colored hair and bird-like wings. While their wings were cleverly hidden in the first trailer, we can now see that Maria is a child of this tribe. As is Nurus, the pilot of the protagonist's gauntlet runner. In this shot of Colrodeo Cliff, you can see him standing with the party, and if you look really close, you can see the tips of his wings poking out from beneath his coat. We also learn a few new details about Gallica. Her fairy nature apparently makes her more attuned to sensing Magla, which may be the magic Juno was referring to. This might also explain that whenever the player activates the sort of third eye ability to analyze the field, Gallica stops in her tracks. You can see the effect emanating outward from her as she casts a spell. Another nice little detail I noticed is that Gallica will often perch onto the protagonist's shoulder, and this is a completely random action. In the English version of the trailer, she's there while he's running through the gauntlet runner, but in the Japanese version, she's not. Also, and this might be a bit of a stretch, I noticed that Gallica wears a very similar looking headband to the traveling boy. I'm not sure if this has any sort of story significance, or if it's simply a bit of clever design to tie the two characters together. Lastly, it was also shown very briefly that the protagonist will be able to create a bond with the mysterious man who resides over the academia room. By the way, he's of the Claymar tribe, the most prolific of the eight allied tribes. They're the ones with the horns on their head, like Strahl and all of the members of the royal family are also Claymar. The title of the trailer, The Royal Tournament, refers to a spell cast during the king's funeral. It's a special type of royal magic that makes the tournament possible and is what that giant speaking face in the sky is all about. During this part of the trailer, we can see several new characters, some of which I think will be the traveling boy's rivals in the election. The first is a Claymar nobleman who we saw briefly in the first trailer. The new trailer seems to show this character assassinating the king. I think his name may be Lewis, as I spotted some citizens in this screenshot saying, Lewis is Claymar, right? Then why would he do such a thing? We hear this character speak in the trailer, and he says, The fool of a king is dead! The fortress at the border was raised by a human mere days ago! You can only blame your king's weakness! Who deserves his crown? A man of proven strength! We next see another Claymar man, and his name is Batlin. He addresses the crowd and proclaims, And so, as his majesty has decreed, whoever has gained the greatest trust of the people by the day of decision shall be our new king. We see the elderly-looking Roag noble who was also featured in the first trailer. Then we see a rather stylish-looking character of the Roseante tribe, introducing another of his tribe. The elf-like Roseante are the second most populous within the United Kingdom and are the same tribe that Hulkenberg is from. They are known for their superior strength and fighting skills. Next is a flamboyant member of the Parapus tribe, who all have a beast-like appearance, including animal-like ears and tails. This tribe has a reputation for hedonism, and while easygoing, are considered rather reckless. We also see a delegation of the avian-like Ishka tribe, and lastly, we see this hammer-wielding female member of the Yugif tribe, the same tribe as Heisme. These bat-looking people are known for their great hearing and compassion towards others. I think this particular Yugif girl's name may be Kaden. I noticed in this portion of the livestream some posters of her in the background. 
These may be campaign posters, and even though the text is very blurry, I was able to make out the words Industroj Kaden, which translates to Kaden Industries. We get a lot of new information regarding the Gauntlet Runners. First up, it appears each of our rivals will have one of their own. There's an anime cutscene showing several crashing into each other. And we can spot others on the various map screens. In this shot of Neuros piloting, it's possible to make out some of the words in the system displays behind him. It says things like Universala Artico, or Universal Joint, and Caleso, or Carriage. The banner on the side reads Rapido, or Quick. We also get to see inside the Gauntlet Runner. This will be the characters traveling home as they campaign across the world to earn the people's favor. You can see here that there are sleeping quarters, and beyond that a map room. Hulkenberg is sitting here and there is an opportunity to spend time with her and increase the traveling boy's imagination stat. These windows are also where we saw him sitting with Gallica in the first trailer, where she says, with everything we've been through recently, I've realized that knowledge is an invaluable asset. I want to keep experiencing new wonders, so let's never stop learning together. The protagonist then proceeds further on up into the runner's watchtower. The website provides footage of the reverse shot of the inside of the runner. By the way, I love this cute little animation of Gallica surveying the surroundings. Other rooms we see include a kitchen where the characters can cook up healing items used in battle as well as a bakery, where here we see Heisme apparently flattening some dough with his feet. There are many opportunities to converse and spend time with your party members. Here on the deck, Heisme says, Sounds like the wind's changed, a sure sign we're nearing the ocean. Drinking during the day with the sounds of nature in the background is something special. Once you too are disciplined, I'll join you. This handshaking icon likely means you have a bonding opportunity. Here Hulkenberg says, haven't you decided on your plans for today? We mustn't let our guard down, but we do need to take a break now and then. In this scene, the traveling boy says, but I'm not feeling down, to which she responds, ah, but I'll be unhappy if you worry about me. I get the impression that Hulkenberg will also serve as a sort of trainer. Here she shouts, put your hands and feet on the ground and walk, let's start. Which leads into this shot where she says, Free your mind of distracting thoughts, Strahl. Ignore your limbs crying out for reprieve. The pain is making them stronger. In this shot, she seems to be giving sword practice and is saying, Yeah, that's right, I'm sorry. Along with spending time with your party members, you can also do things like various chores such as scrubbing the deck and taking a bath. These are very similar to the types of events the Persona games offered that let you increase your social standing. Metaphor Re Fantasio is set in the United Kingdom of Ukronia, and while I couldn't find a high quality photo of the entire map, you can see from this scaled up image the royal capital of Grantrad located in the center, with its imposing regolith grand cathedral in the center of the city. By the way, I should mention there is a giant airship in this shot that looks a lot like a dragon version of a gauntlet runner. I wonder if this is the Skyrunner Charadruis area we saw in the first trailer. We can also make out the old archipelago to the south, where Yufa's Mustari tribe hails from. On this portion of the map, the player is at Martira, a city on the main road between Grontrod and Port Brylehaven. The old castle looming over the city center is an incredible sight to behold. There is one mission to do here and it's titled Apprehend the Real Kidnapper. The next location is Imp's Den, a forest path long disused since the nearby colony was driven to ruin by monster attacks. Now the only inhabitants are raiding Goborns. There's a mission here to do as well entitled The New King of the Imps. Huh, I wonder if this is a Goborn. In this southwest part of the world map, the text reads, the Gauntlet Runner arrived at the warm and fertile Gracia Jungle Forest. It is said that it was once a peaceful place where the voices of fairies could be heard. However, as the forest was cleared for trade, the fairies disappeared as they had lost their divine protection. The entire forest became a den of monsters. The people were afraid of monsters lurking deep within the trees, and the forest was once again closed to darkness. 
the group descends upon a demonic forest that has been abandoned by fairies and even humans. Finally, at this location just south of Grontrad, Gallica says, The northeastern forest is here. It's called Gob's Den. We see the hero arriving in Grontrad and exploring a marketplace. Someone can be overheard saying, Yes, 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 this is how it should be. The night market's so much more alive. There's a vendor on the left selling cheese. And another who appears to be selling meats. And then an Ishka woman selling pottery. And finally, two more icons can be seen in the distance. One is to talk to a guard, and the other has multiple faces on it, and I'm not really certain what that represents. Next, we see the recruitment barracks reception, where you can acquire missions. The soldier says, that's a request to exterminate the King of Goborn. It's a big name, but he's actually the boss of the Goborns. Gallica asks, I know Goborn. They're everywhere, and they're not big monsters, right? He answers, no, they're armed with swords and bows, and they also use magic. If we don't deal with the underlings, the bosses won't come out either. Surprisingly formidable. Lastly, this sequence shows the traveling boy giving a speech as part of his campaign. Before he starts, you can overhear someone nearby saying, Do the people who give speeches here understand the situation in the city? Interacting with the podium makes text appear that says, I feel like I can stand out if I speak here. Gallica chimes in with, Why not call everyone here and give a speech? It might be a good opportunity to express your thoughts and ideas. He thinks, if I give a speech here, I can improve my eloquence. Gallica then reminds him, however, it seems like time will pass, so as long as you have nothing else to do. Also, if things go well, I think I'll get some ohire. Would you like to give a speech? I think ohire in this context means rumors. By the way, I like the little icon they added that signifies choosing this option will pass time. After a few moments, a crowd gathers and one person says, We're not a big city like the capital or Brylehaven. Young people are leaving more and more. Another asks, Will you be able to do anything about this crazy city? Do you have any plans in mind? The traveling boy then gets three options. Let's promote local delicacies. Let's put more effort into tourism. Let's put more power into industry. He picks the first and it appears to work because text appears that says, I managed to win the hearts of the people with my speech. I feel like my eloquence has improved. We then see it get added to his royal virtues. In my last video, I showed the runes that make up words in the Esperanto language used in this world. The new footage has now also revealed what numbers look like. An interesting detail is that each digit has a little triangle as part of the rune to indicate it's a number. I got these from the clock animation that plays when you advance time. By the way, the world uses a 12 hour clock just like us. You can see how the runes for 1 and 0 make up the number 10 for example. They also use these numerals during the live stream, and I really like how Atlas is incorporating them all throughout the game and its marketing materials. So it turns out my previous prediction about humans being the big bad monsters of this world were true. Now, to be clear, in Japanese they're called ningen, which is the Japanese word for human. However, it's written in katakana, which is usually reserved for words that come from other languages. What this means exactly, I cannot say. Regardless, I think we will eventually learn what they are through the course of the game, considering this line from the first trailer when someone shouts, The truth of the humans is laid bare. Their freakish designs are inspired by 15th century Dutch painter Hieronymus Bosch. He was known for his macabre and nightmarish depictions. For example, this smaller human called Homo Oppo is based on this image from Bosch's painting The Temptation of Saint Anthony. The next two major bosses are both from Bosch's most acclaimed work, The Garden of Earthly Delights. This is Homo Gorlo, and it's based on this image from that painting. It appears to be the main boss of the northern border fort. In fact, the introduction to this battle was actually teased in the first trailer. Homo Avades is based on the tree man from the same painting. In this sequence, 
we can see it beginning its attack on the capital city. Someone says, oh my god, was Zorba aiming for this from the beginning? If something like this goes out into the street... It looks like these bosses can have multiple phases to them. For example, you have to crack open the eggshell of Avades before you can later attack the bagpipe-like heart that was previously perched on its head. When the party is running up the heavenly staircase, you can see what I think are the remains of this human in the courtyard below. Also, the current mission objective is Thwart Zorba's Schemes. One of the biggest reveals of the new trailer was the addition of on-field real-time combat to the game. This is an addition to the usual turn-based combat. Game director Hashino-san says that the player can decide when they want to activate turn-based combat when out on the field. In Persona 5, they added the insta-kill confidant ability that made it possible to skip battles with low-level enemies and still get experience. This new system seems to be a nice middle ground by giving players some fun, action gameplay against weaker enemies while also having that deep and rewarding turn-based combat Atlas games are known for. If you look closely, you can see that when fighting enemies on the field, you aren't actually attacking each monster individually. The health bar here represents this entire pack, and once defeated, they all disappear together. After the beginning of the game, you gain access to the squad command to engage in turn-based combat. Once you deplete this yellow meter on the right, you can stagger the enemy and enter a command battle. When you do this, you get this slick transition of the traveling boy's eyes that leads straight into the combat. Likewise, if you get ambushed by an enemy, a slightly different animation plays showing the traveling boy caught off guard. Something else I noticed is that the giant face that represents the king's magic appears in the UI of some battles. Is this part of the press turn combat system or just a bit of UI design? And if it's just design, why does it show up sometimes and not others? Lastly, D the Quiet on Reddit noticed that in this battle, the protagonist is using a gauntlet as a weapon rather than his sword. Some have speculated that this might be tied to him currently using the monk archetype, which appears to be a brawler type. By the way, I noticed they hid the current mission objective in this screenshot to avoid spoilers. Wow, this video has gone on way longer than I expected. So let's wrap things up with some quick leftovers I couldn't fit into any of the other topics. When the party members arrive at Colrodeo Cliff, Stroll exclaims, This is amazing! It's a sheer cliff! Heisme adds, Ah, the thought of falling makes me scared, but at the same time I feel elated! We see a bit of another bonding session between Maria and the traveling boy. The English translation is, I'll make a new sign. This one will have Papa and Miss Fabienne and me and you all smiling together. It ends with the message, Maria conveys a feeling of compassion and trust. Also, it appears you acquire Magla whenever you increase your bonds. In this cutscene, we see the protagonists, Gallica and Hulkenberg traveling together in a cart. Another person uses a magical tool to blast a path forward. It's explained in the live stream that magic is supposed to spring from anyone's imagination, but that art has been lost over time. Now people must use expensive magic tools to conjure magic. The traveling boy is unique, however. He comes from the rare Elda tribe, who are known to have inherited a dangerous and taboo magic. Thus, they are seen as outcasts and mistreated by others. Gallica, as a rare fairy, is also naturally gifted with magic. In this shot of burning books, you can see a chapter titled, What is a Hero? When not in combat, there's an option to view the current popularity ranking, and on the main menu you can access the archetype tree, which we saw briefly in the previous livestream. The Japanese voice actors for the main characters are Natsuke Hanai as the Traveling Boy, who is probably best known as the voice of Tanjiro in the anime Demon Slayer. Sumere Morihoshi voices Galaka. She played Emma in the Promised Neverland anime. Kensho Ono is the voice of Strahl, he played the voice of Giorno Giovanna in Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. And Sayori Hayami is Hulkenberg, probably best known as voicing your forger in Spy Family. 
Finally, here are a bunch of random images from cutscenes. This is the traveling boy with Gallica at the northern border fort. A group of dignitaries standing next to what I think is the bed of the king. Gallica grasping onto the protagonist atop the gauntlet runner. A shot of a Parapus tribe man in binds. It's mentioned in the livestream that Ukronia has slowly over time become torn apart by inequality and discrimination. And lastly, an image of the prince who is under a spell. However, he appears much younger in this shot than he does later, so perhaps that was a flashback. Well, that's all for now, and I hope you learned something. I make these videos because I want to share my excitement for this game, so if you could share it with others who might be interested, I'd really appreciate it. Thanks for watching.